Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SIIEE Energy Storage Chapters webinar tonight, which is an energy storage debate on battery storage versus fuel cell. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the SIE YouTube channel, SIIEE TV, under the Energy Storage Chapter playlist. This channel is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible and subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is in the chat box. The link is there, it's for free. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few days after this webinar. I'd like to now introduce you to one of our two hosts for to this evening. Our first host is Mr. Chris Yelland, who is an energy expert in South Africa. He obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Natal in 1976. In 2009, Chris won the South African National Energy Association Journalism Award for special efforts within the field of journalism to promote greater understanding of energy and its role in sustaining human endeavors. In 2018, Chris was awarded the prestigious South African Institute of Electrical Engineers President's Award for in recognition of his outstanding contribution to the South African electrical engineering industry. In February 2020, Chris was appointed Associate Consultant for Leading Financial Services and Capital Market Research Group Intellidex and Energy Advisor to ATA, the organization undoing tax abuse. Chris is a fellow of the SAIEE, a senior member of the IEEE and a member of the IET. He is also a registered chartered engineer with the Engineering Council in the UK. Welcome, Chris. I would like to introduce you to our second host today, which is Ms. Jo Dean. Joan is a renewable energy, water and waste reduction consultant on projects with organizations including ESCOM, the National Energy Regulator of South Africa, the Department of Energy, as well as the private corporate sector, developing both projects and respective business model frameworks for triple bottom line returns to ensure financial viability and carbon <coughs> mitigation, all linked to the international greenhouse gases inventories, mitigation and adaptation expectations. Currently, she's overseeing a 518 megawatts worth of uh, renewable energy projects under the development, which includes waste to energy as well as PV, both in the embedded generation and utility scale sectors for the private sector. A space to be watched. Her belief, the rationale underlying the na nascent endeavor of a green economy for developing countries is that the market should become the vehicle for tackling the environmental crisis of climate change. Welcome, Joanne. I hand you now over to Chris. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minx, for that introduction. And uh, welcome to Joanne, my co-host, uh, who you can see there. Uh, thanks, Joanne, for all your work in setting this up. Uh, and, um, and also behind the scenes, I believe we have Douglas, uh, who's going to be assisting with some of the uh, back office activities uh, of this debate. So it's really great to be here. And uh, the subject matter of this debate is what is the future of energy storage? Uh, you know, energy storage has become and is set to become one of the major technology game changers uh, in the uh, energy space. Uh, and uh, there are really uh, two applications for, for, for energy storage, perhaps more. But the main ones are stationary applications, which are really used in the power system. Uh, these can be small uh, battery storage systems, even at a domestic level, uh, through to extremely large uh, battery uh, farms, uh, utility scale, uh, and uh, connected to the high voltage uh, grid. Uh, and in between, there's a whole range of applications from domestic to commercial, to industrial, to mining, uh, to renewable energy, uh, and through to uh, utility scale. Uh, at the moment, uh, utility scale energy storage in the past has really been hydropower, I guess, as well as pump water storage schemes. Uh, but uh, certainly in South Africa, there's limited scope for hydropower, 
um, uh, as a water skiers country. Uh, so um, one's looking to other uh, and, and new emerging technologies in the energy storage space. So we've talked about stationary applications, but not to forget uh, the important uh, mobile uh, applications of energy storage. Uh, and here we're talking about the transportation sector. Uh, transportation sector covers everything from uh, you know, vehicles, passenger vehicles, normal cars, uh, through to uh, buses, and taxis, and trucks, and heavy duty uh, road transport, uh, through to uh, trains, um, uh, you know, which are currently either electric or uh, diesel electric uh, trains, uh, replacing the old steam engines, uh, and through to ships. Shipping is an important uh, transportation area. Uh, and, and lastly, aircraft. Uh, so you can see here a whole range of stationary and mobile applications in which uh, energy storage is going to play a, an important role. And of course, uh, there are two emerging technologies. As I say, there's a lot of technologies out of there, uh, but uh, we can talk about hydrogen uh, as an energy storage, and in particular, green hydrogen. Uh, and, and then uh, the, the, the thing that converts it to electricity, which is fuel cells, hydrogen uh, fueled fuel cells, uh, and then uh, through to uh, uh, battery energy storage. And of course, there are other energy storage uh, technologies that we're going to even be talking about today, and that is uh, supercapacitor energy storage. Uh, there are technologies such as uh, gravity energy storage, or what we call potential energy storage, uh, what I like to call tower powers, power towers, whatever. These are, are, are basically potential energy storage schemes. Uh, and, and so we, we're here to debate all these technologies. And I want to just say that uh, in this debate, uh, this is not so much uh, really uh, today anyway, about uh, you know deep science and deep uh, economics and serious stuff like that. Um, I'm really looking to uh, to have an entertaining debate, uh, a fun debate, uh, where people can get passionate, people can argue, please, let's not sit on the fence, let's really uh, argue the cases and get worked up. You know, like a high school debate, you get given a topic to debate, you debate it. You don't really have to necessarily believe everything you say, uh, but let's have fun, let's debate the issues, let's get passionate, let's not sit on the fence, uh, and let's keep the audience uh, interested. Uh, so if I can give that message uh, to to all of the presenters, uh, now uh, if I may just say uh, we get the running order for today. First of all, um, we're going to after I've finished my little blurb here, uh, we're going to have a poll which is going to ask you, the audience, what do you think is the future of energy storage? Is it hydrogen and fuel cell technology? Is it battery or chemical engineering storage technology? Is it both? Uh, and we're going to do this poll before we get into the discussion. Uh, then I'm going to introduce the speakers one by one and um, ask them to give a presentation. Uh, some of them will be using slides, some not. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I ask them, as I say, to really argue the case strongly and passionately. And then after all the presenters, uh, we're going to take another poll on the same question. Uh, what is the future of energy storage? Uh, is it hydrogen and fuel cell technology? Is it battery energy storage technology? Or is it both? Uh, or the other issues? Uh, and, and then I'm going to hand over to my co-host, uh, Joanne. Uh, Joanne Dean is then going to say a few words uh, of wisdom, uh, what she's taken out of this debate. Uh, and then uh, she will hand back to Minx, and Minx will um, uh, give the thanks and close the, the webinar. I think uh, Joanne will probably also give some thanks as well. <laughs> so that's fine. Now, I must say, uh, tell you, we had uh, you know, a number of presenters here, yeah, six in total, uh, but it may be that one or two are, have not been able to make it. I have, we have heard recently from Tobias, Tobias Bishop Nims. He forgot his wife's birthday tonight. That is a very unforgivable sin. And uh, he has begged us to uh, uh, allow him uh, to make amends with his wife and take her out for supper. And uh, so unfortunately, he will not be joining us. But we'll see how it goes. Um, and that gives us a little bit more 
time to, uh, to debate the issues. Uh, so that's where we are right now. So um, I'm now going to see if we can try and do the poll. So the poll, this is like new tech for me. Uh, you know, it's not so easy. And uh, I've got uh, Douglas standing by at the SAIE, I believe, who's going to help us with this poll. But there you can see the questions. What is the future of stationary and mobile energy storage? Is it hydrogen and fuel cell technology? Is it battery energy storage technology? And I'd like to include under that um, a, a super cap uh, is a kind of a battery. Okay, it's not a battery, but it's a kind of a battery. Uh, so we'll call that battery energy storage and super cap technology, super capacitor technology. Or are both of the above uh, the solution? Uh, and and uh, we're going to be debating all of these issues, but it's important and interesting to get a feeling for what your view is before we start the debate. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, participants in this webinar, uh, please, uh, can I ask you to vote? You can select only one of these three options. So, if you can, uh, uh, you know, put your dot in the radio button and cast your vote. Select one of these options, hydrogen and fuel cell, or battery energy storage technology, including SuperCap, or both. And please, can you now vote? Uh, I'm hoping that you are busy voting right now. Um, I'm not seeing the results live, uh, but first, I hope yes, you are voting. Sorry? Yes, we are busy voting. Yes, we are busy voting. We'll give it another 20 seconds, then we have one minute of voting, and then I will end. But I will close okay. the poll. Okay, so whilst... Uh, uh, the poll is uh, uh, you know, under, uh, underway. My job is just to chit chat with the audience uh, and uh, keep you amused uh, while the voting is taking place. But please cast your vote. We're going to give it a bit more time. Uh, Minx will uh, let me know when time is up. Uh, I see, by the way, we've got a total of 65 people attending uh, the oh. webinar in addition to our um, our, 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 our uh, presenters. Ah, there we go. Look at that. Hey, what an amazing technology this is. So you can see here, 7% said that hydrogen is the answer. 13% said uh, battery energy storage is the answer. And most of you, 80% have said that both are part of the answer. So that's really interesting uh, to, uh, to note. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to uh, enjoy listening to the debate. I'm just making a note of this. 7%, 13%, and 80%. Right, I've got that. Because we're going to then compare it and see how the case was argued afterwards. Uh, so, presenters, you, your job is to argue your case passionately uh, for one or the other. Uh, and now it's my pleasure and duty to call upon our first presenter, Chris Jobert, if I may read out his uh, CV, which you will see on the screen. Chris served as a senior test engineer with Datsun Nissan factory in South Africa. Ha! So he's obviously interested in batteries for motor vehicles, I guess. And he then moved to SOMCHEM as a senior quality engineer involved in quality planning and testing of explosives and propellants. Ah, so he might tell us something about how explosive hydrogen is. Who knows? Chris established Jaber Consult, subsequently setting up Africa Energy Storage Solutions, AEWS, with engineering partners Francois Fasaki and Vesi van der Westhuizen, uh, following his passion, I like that, passion, passion for renewable energy and the development of the people of Africa. So, Chris, we're going to have a little bit of extra time. I'm going to give you 10 minutes, and I'm just looking at my clock here. So your speaking slot is going to be a little over 10 minutes, ends at 5 to 6. And we're going to stick to that timing quite uh, strictly. Uh, so your, your speaking slot starts now, and it ends at 5 to 6. Uh, please go ahead, Chris, and give us your presentation while I switch off my camera and mic. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I uh, selected to be neutral and have a stance that it's not hydrogen versus batteries. It's really a matter of horses for courses. And, and I added the green uh, heading there on both sides 
there is a huge uh, drive towards green hydrogen in a country, but I'm also passionate about the fact that we need green batteries as well. Now, you will see that my background is blue at the top and green at the bottom. And that is because I believe we cannot just look at green energy in terms of the uh, global warming and, and preventing uh, uh, CO2 and, and stuff like that in, in the sky. We also need to care for uh, the earth underneath us. So you can turn us to the next slide, please. Next, there you are. So um, this slide seems pretty full, but, but I'm not going to talk about every block there, but it's important to understand that uh, looking at hydrogen and batteries, the field of application is extremely wide, and there are many, many uh, technologies. I did not even include thermal energy storage and, and uh, the, the uh, energy vault uh, type of storage, uh, but I think we've got enough to talk about. And basically I've divided this between electric vehicles slash transport and uh, stationary storage. And, and they are quite different uh, fields of application. With electric vehicles and transport, we need something with high energy capacity and uh, that is not too heavy, etc. With stationary storage, we have more space, especially in Africa. And uh, in, in most instances for the larger applications, there is enough room for a technology that has a lower energy uh, density. Now, in terms of batteries, uh, I've just looked at, at lithium-based batteries uh, and then supercapacitor. I've seen these in action where they act as batteries. Um, and, and Omer will, will talk about this later. And then there's a new kid on the block, which is graphene aluminium ion batteries, which has been developed at the Brisbane University. And I believe they are going to give lithium batteries quite a go. It's a much cleaner technology, but they still have uh, some of the shortcomings in terms of short life, etc., limited cycling. Supercapacitor, of course, is already used in this country in a big way and in terms of residential and, and lodges and uh, uh, industrial applications. And it's ideal for, for even for electric vehicles, for cars, uh, once they get the uh, energy uh, density uh, on par. But I believe their latest uh, development is a solid state supercapacitor with an energy density of 450 watt per kilogram, which is exceptional. Uh, and one of these days we will see these in electric vehicles, hopefully uh, uh, replacing lithium batteries, which I've colored red here because it's part of my passion is that we, uh, in Africa, we don't want to turn Africa into a lithium and cobalt dump. Uh, and this may be uh, controversial, but I've, I've looked into this for a long time before I selected my uh, ideal battery. Um, then on the hydrogen side, there's, there's also a number of applications, and I believe this is going to be uh, impacted by what kind of infrastructure we have. We know in Europe, Parts of the US and Japan, there are very good uh, hydrogen infrastructures, and, and that will probably drive um, towards more cars running on hydrogen plus fuel cell. Uh, in South Africa, I believe the first big drive is for large trucks, both in underground mining and then long haul trucks with Sasol and, and uh, Toyota starting this. Uh, hydrogen highway between Johannesburg and Durban. And, and uh, I believe that is part of the global drive towards uh, hydrogen in electric trucks. Uh, and it will be uh, quite feasible if, if there are dedicated highways for this. Uh, and we don't, I don't foresee that we will have the infrastructure countrywide to run our, most of our EVs in future 
on, on hydrogen, except if we can get the latest technology of producing liquid hydrogen. And uh, I, I see that, uh, is it one of the uh, mining uh, companies is now investing in the uh, development of a transformer that will convert uh, liquid hydrogen on board in a vehicle to gas, which can then drive the fuel cell. And that would be able to use our current uh, petrol and diesel infrastructure for, for storage and distribution. And that may change. That may be a, quite an interesting uh, aspect in the future. And that may change things between hydrogen and batteries. Uh, but of course, ships is, is uh, also high on the list uh, globally. And this will drive us to provide clean or green hydrogen to passing ships around our shores. Um, and, and we already have some experimental uh, trucks running underground in, in some of our mines. I'm working more on the stationary storage side with, with uh, larger applications. And again, we have lithium-based batteries there, uh, too many of them. Supercapacitor is also in at this point in time in the smaller uh, market. They uh, have taken quite a market in South Africa on residential uh, storage, and then uh, but they are also now gearing up towards uh, megawatt scale uh, batteries. And uh, I don't believe the graphene aluminium iron will be in the market soon on the larger scale ap applications. And uh, hydrogen and fuel cell is an interesting one. There are already applications in megawatt scale of energy storage uh, applications, although my feeling is that the electricity to storage to electricity uh, round trip efficiency is too low to make it a, a general uh, energy storage uh, medium. Uh, to me, flow batteries is where uh, things are going. Uh, I see in the US and Europe, uh, people are looking more and more and governments towards long duration storage for the future. And there, the flow batteries are really um, playing a big role and they're already commercialized and in production. Hydrogen and fuel cell, um, or hydrogen on, it, on its own, is actually also pitched as a interseasonal storage medium in very cold areas uh, where you don't have much sun in, in, in winter. So that is another application where hydrogen may work uh, better. But um, to, in my mind, flow batteries is the way to go, especially where you have many cycles per day. I don't see how lithium batteries can actually last in, in uh, variable renewable energy environment where you have more than one cycle a day, so you will just half the lifetime, etc. And with the flow batteries, we're talking about 25 years uh, a lifetime, and uh, I'm working with 12 to 15 hours uh, duration at full power, etc. So uh, I think between all of these, what I believe we need on, on the stationary storage side is what I have at the bottom of the screen. They need to be safe, non-toxic. They must be able to do unlimited cycling, uh, have capability of long duration, long life, no degradation through more cycling or depth of discharge, low uh, O and M cost, quick response and, and scalable from very small to, to uh, hundreds of megawatts. So that's my story. Thank you, Max. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And I've, I'm amazed at your timekeeping. You're absolutely spot on time-wise. Uh, you had 10 minutes given. You were just under 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, that's fantastic. Uh, an interesting presentation. Mar I can see you as a draught sitter. You're sitting on the fence. You're not taking a position. But I, I think you have taken a position. Uh, courses for courses. That's your message. That's the message I took from you, Chris. So thank you very much uh, for that.
uh, a really interesting, uh, insightful sort of overview of, uh, of all these different energy storage uh, technologies, including super caps, including batteries, both flow batteries, lithium batteries, other batteries, hydrogen, and all the works. So really, uh, thanks for covering that so comprehensively. Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next presenter. And I'm trying to see if I can just, ah, there we go. Um, so I've just got his CV in front of me. I see it on the screen, but let me quickly read it out. Uh, Mikhail has over 15 years of international business experience in energy and finance, including a CEO and co-founder of Bushfelt Energy since 2015. He spent seven years with McKinsey and Company in Moscow, Johannesburg, as in Moscow and Johannesburg, advising national governments, uh, utilities and manufacturers on growth strategy and policy and leading operational turnarounds in the energy sector. He was the portfolio manager at Sovereign Bank uh, USA, which is now uh, Santander Bank and chairman of the South. And he is, or oh, is he or was he, but he is a notable a figure in the founding of the South African Energy Storage Association, and I'm sure he's on the board. Yes, he's the chair of the Energy Storage Committee at Vanitech, the Global Association of Vanadium Producers. He has a BA History and a BA Economics from the University of Massachusetts, a Diploma in Economics from the London School of Economics, and an MBA from INSEAD. So really a person extremely well experienced uh, in the area of uh, energy storage and business for that matter. Uh, so it's a great uh, honor to have you here, Mikhail. I hope you're not going to be a draught sitter and you're going to give it a, a stick and tell us uh, what your views are on um, uh, on battery storage versus hydrogen. And, and in particular, I'm interested in your experience in flow batteries, uh, which is a stationary application. So um, let me just get the timing sorted out now. It's I'm going to say it's two minutes to two minutes to six. So you've got until eight minutes past six, ten minutes to state your case and argue the point. Uh, over to you, Mikhail. Are you there, Mikhail? I don't see your picture on the screen. Can you switch on your camera? Mikhail. <laughs> Are you there, Mikhail? I suggest we go over to our next speaker, and if Mikhail comes on, um, then we can uh, just go back. Okay. So Mikhail's not online at the moment. Maybe he had a problem connecting or something. So with that, we're going to move instead uh, to Bertie Stradom. Uh, and let me get his details on here. Okay, so. Uh, yes, sorry, we've got Mikhail on. Chris, Aha, Mikhail is on. Mikhail has arrived. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, we were just introducing you and uh, wondered whether you may have had a tech problem and not been able to connect. Great to see you there. I have introduced you and welcomed you. So it's now over to you to state your case as strongly as you possibly can uh, while I uh, sign off and listen in. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And uh, sorry, 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 Bertie. Um, but I'll, I'll promise to make it uh, quicker. Um, my, my, my position. Uh, yeah, Chris, you asked us for not to sit on the fence. So as I told you, I'm just going to go to one side and hopefully not fall on my face. Um, so I think that there's three points that I would like to make. Uh, let's start off with the fact that, um, you know, if we had to choose one of these and both was not an option, it's clearly, um, you know, the batteries are clearly not the future because they're both the future and the present. If you actually look at what what is used for storage right now in in vehicles, yes, there's a there's a hydrogen powered uh, vehicle here and there. There's a, a forklift here and there. There's a truck here and there. But if you look at the number of vehicles, electric vehicles that have batteries, whether they're cars or scooters, we're talking about millions. So this is this is not even thinking about the future. It's already the present, and it's indicative of just how fast. The, the use of batteries in, in mobility is growing is going to grow. Same thing on stationary storage. Batteries are already being deployed in, at, at giga, giga scale. Hydrogen, yes, there might be a megawatt project here and a research megawatt project there, um, and this company is invested in this, and it might get there. Batteries are already here. 
they are already dominating um, and the amount of technologies that batteries have is, is diverse and there's even kind of some technologies that are similar to batteries as uh, Chris mentioned. But if you're talking, comparing just batteries with hydrogen, one is already there, already proven, already making money and, uh, and decarbonizing the grid, reducing the costs for the grid um, and, uh, and, and allowing remote communities to, to finally get access to, to, to electricity. Whereas everything else um, is just hopefully we'll get there by by 2025 or by 2030. So I think that's that's the key, that's the, the key thing. And by the way, that's also very true for South Africa. In 2020, so last year, the sixth largest uh, battery market resident for residential batteries was South Africa. Um, and then you've seen on the utility side, ESCOM has got a large program, the risk mitigation round, everything that was not a ship. Um, had a had a large battery tied to it, and we'll probably see even more. So this is not even just a global thing of a uh, phenomenon of batteries already being being deployed. It is a South African story as well. And once we have more electric vehicles in in, in country, um, certainly that 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 fact um, will also be relevant to to South Africa and not just the um, um, some some other parts of the world. So that's the first point: is batteries are already here. Um, the second one is if you think about export um, export potential, and that that is I think a big piece of the the hydrogen story in South Africa. But but the reality is we cannot manufacture. Nobody no one is really promoting the manufacture of hydrogen based technologies in South Africa or of components. Where whereas that is possible for battery storage. I mean, and I know that's possible because I'm, 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 I'm doing it um, for, for, for vanadium. Um, yes, we've got the vanadium in the ground, but we can actually make the, the electrolyte that actually stores the energy. And we believe we can, we can do the, the, the batteries here themselves. And I think that's not only limited to the vanadium version of, of battery storage, that is also possible with, with, um, with other technologies as well. In hydrogen, Yes, you can potentially export hydrogen, and I think that there's still a lot of questions around how those assumptions work. But, but are you then a manufacturing? Are you building manufacturing capacity in country, or do we remain basically a resource? We're substituting one resource export for another. And that, that has some merit, but it's actually not transformational to the economy. It's not diversifying the economy. It's just basically substituting one for another. If we were talking about manufacturing, um, you know, hydrogen-based, um, let's say, fuel cells or uh, or, or other equipment, um, electrolyzers, things like that, but that's not that's not where the the the, um, the let's say the lobbying or the promotion is. Everyone is telling us, no, import those from Germany, import those from China, import those from Korea, import those from the U.S., and then you can you can combine them with solar panels that have been imported from China or from the U.S. Um, and then you can you can export hydrogen to to us. So I think that that's another big point is that you know batteries um, allow us to diversify the economic base of South Africa. So if I was thinking about that, um, I, I would definitely be pushing for 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 batteries. But then the last point I, I would make because I started this with the assumption of if and and maybe this this um, this does uh, build on on what um, what, uh, what 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 Chris. Uh, mentioned not not Chris Yellen but Chris Robert in terms of yeah you know it's not a it's not necessarily a a binary future one or the other this is a this is a question that I'm asked fairly frequently if you think about the future of energy storage is it going to be a one technology dominates um, you know an example that people often use is well for people who are a little bit older um, is it is it going to be you know Betamax or or VHS and only and only one one out and you know my own vision for for storage is that it it will it will more reflect mobility and and how we get around the world because electricity is similar in that in that in that way where there's there's there is a little bit of an element of horses for horses again to um to to quote my my colleague so there is a future where you would actually have complementarity between the different applications i actually think energy based applications of hydrogen are probably some of the worst ones because of the efficiencies, because of the costs, and because there are better alternatives. Nevertheless, there are use cases for, for hydrogen, especially if it's coupled with, with when you're gonna use hydrogen for other things as well, and the energy storage bit is a secondary or maybe even a tertiary 
use of that hydrogen that just happens to be stored, but the um, but the the manufacturing is actually oriented towards some some sort of other industrial process uh, or an ammonia-based process. It, you're not making hydrogen for the sake of just storage. That's a that's a that's a benefit that you could use a few days a year. Then I see a lot of benefit in hydrogen being part of the um, of the solution mix, especially when batteries um, can cover a few hours a day um, between kind of that, that long duration. And then we can think about hydrogen as more of a seasonal storage, either to cover days when there's adverse weather or days when there are rare instances of, of massive uh, demand spikes or, or maybe some sort of other load, load issues, um, especially until the grid is fully decarbonized, we may still see unplanned uh, outages whether it's a nuclear uh, plant that is that is on repair or or an expected situation with one of the coal plants, so I think that there is a a hybrid model that, that that in my opinion is a lot more likely than a binary one where it's either one future or the other. Um, just because the economics do not do not purport to support one technology to for everything, and I use mobility because if you think of how we get around, we walk, uh, we bike, we cycle. Um, we take a car, sometimes we take a bus, sometimes we take a train, sometimes it's an airplane. And all of those um, sometimes will be for one person, but they're also different. So they're, they're, they're a function of how, you know, size and how many people need to be carried, um, which I think is also true for, for, for electricity to some degree. And also how far, you know, these things need to be, um, you know, people need to be carried or goods need to be carried. And I think the same applies to electricity as well. So I think we'll see a hybrid a hybrid uh, future rather than, than one or the other. Um, and that would be my position. But if I only had to pick one and you had a gun to my head, I'm falling off the fence by far um, in favor of batteries. Uh, now, listen, uh, listen, Mikhail, just stay on the line because uh, you've got two more minutes to go. And I wanted to just sort of probe you here and say, uh, why has Flow Batteries got such a small share of the market? Uh, lithium is like totally, totally, totally dominant. And a lot of good talk about uh, flow batteries, but where's the volumes? Where's the volume? So maybe in your last minute or two, if you can just say a few words on, on, on where things are going uh, with uh, flow batteries, vanadium flow versus lithium. Thanks. Yeah, Chris, it's a, it's a good question. I think if you, you know, three years ago or four years ago, I asked the same question about lithium, you know, you, 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 you could ask the same questions like, well, why would you support lithium when uh, lead acid or, um, you know, sodium sulfur or pumped hydro has a much bigger market share? And by the way, pumped hydro still has the massive uh, market share. So even lithium is, is basically still just a few, a few drops um, in, the, in, in the bucket of stationary, stationary storage. But absolutely, it's a technology um, that, that, was, that was more, more advanced. Um, and it remains more advanced. I think also it's important to realize that in stationary storage, there's actually at the moment three different lithium technologies that compete. So it might not be fair to just say call it lithium because they actually compete amongst themselves. And we're actually seeing a big trend uh, towards lithium ferrophosphate away from the um, from the from the from the from the uh, NMC and uh, an LTO based based chemi uh, chemistries for storage because because you have a different need. Because you need you you need to you don't really care about some of the benefits that have driven the development of lithium ion batteries, which are more tied to electric vehicles, such as their energy density and their and their weight. You no longer need those things, so you're actually seeing a shift within the lithium space. And I think that that shift is going to continue um, to require, for example, long duration. Long duration, which I define as at least four hours of daily storage per day. I actually define as at least three hours, but most people will say more than four. Um, that has not really been the need, that has not really been the, the use case for, for storage, for the stationary storage. It has been more about ancillary services, frequency uh, response, and there have been markets in, in the US initially and now in Europe for that. But now that we're actually seeing that we're trying to time shift when energy is produced um, to when it needs to be consumed, specifically renewable energy, which is variable. We know when it will happen, but we know also when it will not happen. And so we need more, do more long duration for that. And that's where flow batteries really shine. We haven't had, really had a need for that until recently. And shine is an exception to your um, stat. There's about two gigawatt hours of projects that, um, that are uh, in, in process right now in, in, in construction in China. 
So if you looked at the Chinese market, you'd actually see flow batteries making a dent, whereas I agree with you outside of China and, and maybe Japan, they really haven't yet. Great. Well, thank you. We're now spot on time again. And uh, thanks for those insights. I think that was uh, really valuable. And uh, uh, thanks for your uh, general views. Uh, and, and really, it's an honor to have you here and give us these insights uh, from a person who knows a hell of a lot about this uh, energy storage market. So uh, thanks very much, Mikhail. And it's now my pleasure to uh, carry on now and introduce uh, you to Bertie Stratum, uh, an old colleague, a friend of mine, uh, who uh, uh, ha I think knows a, a lot also about the storage and the hydrogen markets. So Bertie Stratum is a qualified electronics engineer with an honors degree in business economics. So another engineer and businessman. Uh, he's, at, got, he's had at least 35 years of experience, uh, 24 years uh, in the financial sector, uh, including 20 years at IDC, the Industrial Development Corporation. Uh, his experience includes industry development, project development and implementation, project financing and structuring, transactional due diligence, venture capital, information technology, systems engineering, quality assurance, operational management, and logistics engineering. So a really wide range of uh, engineering activities uh, heavily in the financial space, making things happen financially uh, is how I see it. His most recent involvements relate to energy storage uh, industry development and the associated project development opportunities towards establishing a local South African industry. He has a good understanding of the energy sector, especially batteries. He retired from the IDC in November 2021 and formed his own company. It sounds something like me. I did the same in November 2020. No, was it 2019? So I'm a little bit older than you, um, uh, Bertie. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, he retired from the IDC, as I say, in November 2021 and formed his own company, Futurist Advisory, focusing on project development, business case development, and specialist studies and transactional advisory. So. Uh, now moving to a man who talks about money and uh, and tries to make things happen in South Africa. Great to have you, Bertie. Over to you. I know you've got a few slides, uh, so uh, over to you right now. Your 10 minutes starts now. Thank you, Chris, um, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to try and do a bit of a parallel today, and I think if we live in the current uh, environment of COVID, um, we are getting used to a term which is called bubbles. And obviously, I think if you look at the picture in front of you, you will see there's, there's various bubbles within this um, energy network. And all these bubbles basically uh, composes um, the energy storage framework. And if we dig into some of these, these bubbles, you will see that there are smaller bubbles uh, which basically represents the various technology that could satisfy this, the specific bubbles. So if we look at these bubbles, we will see, uh, although they look, everyone typically about the same size, they are very different. Uh, they are different in the characteristics that you need for each of those bubbles. Um, they've got different needs. Um, but I think the one common aspect that we can look at all of these bubbles is that those bubbles currently represent a substantial exponential growth of the storage market that, that we're looking at. And I think if we look at where we were five years ago and where we are moving today, I think that support that we are a trajectory for, for greater exponential growth. Similar to the COVID, um, obviously what you will see is you will see there's a mutation of various uh, variants in this bubbles. Uh, and that basically underlines what technology you're using. So you can either look at the lithium ion space, you can look at the flow battery space where you've got different technologies within the line that the lithium space, you've got different various chemistries. Um, and then there's also other components such as the zinc bromide, zinc air, uh, liquid metal, uh, all those type of things that's coming up to the forefront now. But I think what is key to these is that if you look at all these bubbles, um, they are not the same and they are different 
and how those bubbles are implemented within these networks uh, depends on the suitability of the specific technology that you want to, to use for the use and the application. Um, there's different levels of maturity. You've got a bit of mature, you've got still upcoming, you've got sold to certain technologies, which is an R&D. Um, and that also relies on what is the market readiness. Um, and subsequently, obviously, what is the capability of meeting the needs of these individual bubbles um, based on technology that's available and what is the best in terms of cost and all those aspects. I think what is clear if you look at this, this view is that there is no really one battery storage technology which is a fit for all. Um, there's a lot of segregation that we see in developing in terms of long duration versus short duration where you look at complete ecosystems with non-complete ecosystems. So I think there's a lot of challenges, but there's no one fit all. Um, and then obviously I think the secondary, what you will also see here is that there is a, a differentiation between um, whether it's a stationary application which is stuck at one place or whether you have a mobility unit which you can utilize and drive around until you have to recharge. We can get to the next slide, please. Obviously, these, these bubbles, as we see them now, will transform over time. Uh, and I think there's various scenarios that is possible, uh, which is currently dominant, which will be dominant in future. Uh, but I think what is clear is batteries is, is yet to stay. It's not going to change. And the reality is, is not even when batteries is going to come, it's already happening and it's growing at a substantial pace. So batteries effectively already left the station and it's not any different in, in South Africa. If we look at a few years ago, we were trying to understand these individual bubbles and how they work together and how they can satisfy and what is the applications for the different technologies. And I think if you look at where we are today, is battery storage has become a common language, uh, but unfortunately it's not, not without challenges. Um, so I think what we see it today is that South Africa is, is already on the train that left the station and the road out in South Africa is slowly starting to picking up and it's starting picking up speed going forward. Next slide, please. And I think why I want to say that South Africa is already on, on the train. Um, if you look at this slide, um, it basically just gives an indication of what is out there from a substantial, mainly the stationary market in South Africa, and, and what is the capacity that is linked to these opportunities if you look at the ESCOM tenders that's currently out, there's three tenders for seven sites and there's still more to come. Um, the risk mitigation around we had, if we look at the non-gas type of projects and you look at the ratio of um, storage proposed versus the, the, the nominal capacity of those specific installations, you will see that about 82% of the nominal uh, or nameplate capacity uh, is also supported by, by storage. And if we take that same ratios and we apply that to bid round five, which has been submitted now, um, you will see these numbers is growing. If you look at the IRP, there's a provision of storage in the near future. And uh, obviously, I think if we assume that the amendment of Schedule 2 um, will bring in a lot of self-generation and make certain assumptions are there, I think we, we're getting close to, within the next two to three years, uh, opportunity for about 3.7 gigawatts 
and close to 15 gigawatt hours of storage that need to come online or be implemented in South Africa. If we take a conservative estimate of saying that these solutions can be deployed by around about $250 per kilowatt hour, we're talking about 53 billion investment that we need uh, to or will happen in South Africa in the next two to three years. I think the unfortunate of, of this is that within South Africa currently we have very limited technology and capacity to deliver on these opportunities in the short to medium term. And unfortunately, I think a lot, the biggest portion of that 53 billion rand will leave our shores and go to other econom economies. I think what it basically tells us that battery storage presents the country with a huge opportunity. It could help in our economic recovery. And uh, for that reason, I think um, it will also future going forward play a significant role in the just transition of our energy system in South Africa. And I think we can also achieve localization and become a gateway into Africa, which provides us even more, more opportunities. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, that's really interesting, Bertie. And thanks for those insights uh, that uh, battery storage is going to become uh, and already is a huge opportunity for South Africa, a massive opportunity and a real one. This is not pie in the sky stuff. This is not going to take 10 years to happen. It's already starting and it's going to be big. Uh, and I think that message has come through from other speakers as well. Uh, as Mikhail said, uh, 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 that this is happening now. There's not the future or pie in the sky. It is right now. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm sure there will be more to say on, on this uh, coming going forward. So uh, thank you indeed uh, uh, to, to Bertie for that. So now it's my pleasure and uh, to introduce you to uh, Professor Dmitry Basarabov. Uh, Dimitri, I hope you're online. Um, I didn't see you earlier online. Yes, is he online? Sorry. Um, no, Professor Besarov can't make it. Uh, we'll just move on to our next speaker. Sorry. Okay, let's go on to the next speaker, please. Uh, okay, it's now my great pleasure to introduce to you um, uh, Omar Ghani. Uh, if I may just get your picture on there, Omar. Uh, uh, there we go. Now that's Dimitri. Uh, da, 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 da. Hang on a second. I just <laughs> forgive me, but I have a separate system that I can read. There we go. No, that's not the right one. Dirty. Gee whiz. I'm getting confused here, but just, ah, I've got it, Omar. Thank you very much, Omar. It, it's a great pleasure to, to have you here. And uh, Omar is our uh, super cap man. Uh, and I'm really fascinated to hear what you have to say, Omar, because I don't know a lot about super caps. I hear the words, uh, but I don't know the details. And I'm hoping to gain a few insights from you. So let me just say that Omar is uh, logging in from the USA, I believe. Uh, that's a long way away. And it's made possible by this amazing technology that we have before us brought to you by electrical engineers uh, and electronic engineers and information technology engineers, which is the very heart of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers as activities. So thanks for this uh, wonderful technology from electrical engineers. Omar, Omar has commercialized super cap storage, a groundbreaking energy storage technology for grid scale, stationary applications and electric vehicles and charging stations. Well, that has already broadened my mind because I kind of imagined that it was for small stuff. Uh, accelerating, uh, it's helping to accelerate electric vehicle adoption and shifting from fossil fuels in the transportation industry. Supercap storage is an environmentally sustainable, non-degrading, long-lasting solution that increases energy independence and access, and therefore eliminates the impact of climate change. Well, those are those are big claims, Omar. 
and I hope you're going to fill us in and tell us more about it. Over to you now. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Good evening, gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies in the audience. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, to participate in this debate. Yes, uh, Chris, uh, 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 I'll start with a little history of, super, of storage. Um, a capacitor storage is actually the first form of storage that was invented in 1746 by a Dutch scientist by the name of Peter van Muschenbroek. This was 54 years before uh, Mr. Alexander Volta invented the chemical battery and in 1800, and, and uh, the fuel cell was invented in 1839 by a Welsh scientist named William Grove. Um, Capacitors have become supercapacitors, so they are bigger capacitors. And since 1746 and 1800, supercapacitors or capacitor storage has been used for power applications, which are uh, fast charge, fast discharge, or short bursts of energy uh, for, for short duration. Um, and chemical uh, batteries invented by Mr. Volta have been used for energy storage applications, which is large amounts of energy over longer durations. But in 2016 and 17, Kilowatt Labs was able to uh, use super caps for energy storage. So delivering large amounts of energy over long periods of time. Why is this a very um, a major uh, uh, event in the storage world? Uh, the reason is that a super cap or capacitor storage is an electrostatic process, whereas chemical storage is an electrochemical process. I know this is not scientific, but I just want to uh, uh, highlight the differences which result in the performance. And electrostatic uh, uh, process does not require a chemical electrolyte and neither is there a chemical, uh, chemical reaction during charge and discharge. Whereas in a chemical battery or a chemical process, uh, there's a chemical electrolyte and a, and a chemical reaction which limits the performance of chemical batteries, which also make fuel cells look good. So first of all, um, so, so that sets the differentiation. And uh, uh, can I have the next slide, please? So, series supercap storage. So, so this differentiation and our technology, electronics technology, results in a in a product that's degradation free. So it doesn't degrade with cycling or over time. It's a longer life because it doesn't have an electrolyte that's degrading. It's faster charging because there's no chemical reaction, so you can charge supercaps in seconds. Um, it's cheaper, thanks to us, and it's fully recyclable and a safer alternative to chemical batteries and hydrogen fuel cells. Next slide, please. please. So I've made this comparison for uh, vehicles and transportation, and I've just compared it to lithium ion uh, for the moment, but it demonstrates the advantages of supercap storage which leads me to the discussion about uh, hydrogen versus uh, battery storage. So, so the storage process is electrostatic and electrochemical across the two uh, technologies. And the uh, storage medium in supercaps is the surface area of the supercap, whereas in the lithium ion or, or chemical batteries is the chemical electrolyte. So what that means is that there's, there's no capacity degradation with cycling in supercap storage. Uh, its capacity is always available and because the charge discharge process is electric and not chemical, you can, the standard charge for zero to 100% on our mobility products is less than six minutes and zero to 80% is less than four minutes, but this without degrading the product. You know, you can charge a chemical battery very quickly. You can charge it in four minutes and six minutes and, and, and 30 minutes, but it degrades the battery uh, considerably. So this is a huge uh, advantage. And then uh, there's no heat generated during cycling because it's an electro electrostatic process, not an electrochemical. Therefore, there's no thermal runaway risk. Therefore, it's safe. And uh, therefore, ambient temperature doesn't affect it because no heat is being generated. And therefore, uh, the, the cooling infrastructure required is minimal. It's, com uh, it's not combustible. There are no chemicals in there, so it's not combustible. Now, here is where we, we, we diver, diverge a little bit. Uh, for, for a given form factor and limitation of size and weight, uh, we are able to achieve about two thirds uh, the range of, of, uh, of lithium ion. 
which means it's a little bit less than hydrogen fuel cell. So, so what that means is that you know, if 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 a, a lithium-ion car can go, lithium-ion-based vehicle can go 300 miles, we'll be able to go 200 miles, and a fuel cell will go about 250. But because of the fast charge capability, you know, if a truck travels a thousand miles and a fuel cell requires two refuelings and a capacitor-based system requires four refuelings, the difference in a 15 to 20 hour journey is half an hour, which is neither here nor there. So I think that the, currently the, the, uh, the fact that the super cap storage that we uh, sell and manufacture and, and have invented uh, is about two thirds, uh, delivers about two thirds the range uh, is not a big hurdle. However, uh, uh, we are also going to be launching, uh, as Chris has already said uh, in his uh, uh, in his in his time, that we are launching solid state supercaps with with an energy density of um, uh, expected to be over 400 watt hour per kilogram, which then extends the range beyond anything uh, and gets it closer to actually fossil fuels. Um, and that uh, is uh, in a prototype stage, but we are about a year away from commercializing it. So within a year, our energy density, which is currently about 130 watt hours per kilogram, will go up to about hopefully more than 400 watt hours per kilogram. So, uh, so, so in terms of, so now uh, I'm going to address the question of the debate, right? Um, uh, yes, it's horses for courses, but you know, uh, um, in the in the in in the IT world, uh, there are two systems. There are no horses for courses. There's uh, uh, you know uh, uh, Windows, and then there's I uh, you know the Apple system. Uh, in the in telecom, there are two systems. You know GSMA and the one I, I don't know what's the one in US is called, but it's it's two systems. So so I think that between uh, like Mikhail uh, uh, rightly said between battery storage and fuel cell, um, I think um, fuel cell uh, has a very long way to go. And uh, the way that the industry is evolving towards energy storage in mobility, in stationary applications, I think it's going to be very challenging for um, um, fuel cells to, to make, be used, uh, you know, in, with, with any significant volume. Um, you know, there's a great degree of work being done in the lithium ion industry as well. There's a great degree of work being done by us. So our technology, the battery storage technology, which is electrostatic or electrochemical, is going to be uh, uh, more and more widely used. Uh, our super cap storage not only is used for uh, EVs, and we are rolling the this out in, in, in EVs now. Only this year we've started to Make products. If you can go to the next slide, it's a just a just uh, it's about our product. So this is a, this is real. So these products are now being deployed uh, by certain fleet owners in the Middle East and uh, in 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 uh, in Asia. Um, so so this these are the original pro uh, the the initial products. But uh, you know it's uh, getting more and more deployed in in EVs and in stationary applications. We are seeing a tremendous amount of growth because of the attributes and the qualities, performance capabilities of the, of the system. So coming back to the debate between uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cells and, and um, uh, battery storage, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when, when all this settles, the dust settles, the key driver always is financial, right? The cost per unit, is it called? What is cost per kilowatt hour? Which technology delivers a cost per kilowatt hour which is lower, uh, or a cost per mile which is lower? Uh, and this cost per unit aggregates all the inputs. It aggregates the supply chain. It aggregates the manufacturing cost. It aggregates scale, and that product, uh, you know, comes to a cost per unit which is better than uh, the alternatives. And I think that uh, my stance um, uh, would be that uh, hydrogen fuel cells um, uh, will be a footnote in the history of storage, uh, whereas battery technology, and in, in my view, within battery technology, electrostatic-based storage will, will dominate. 
yes, there is, uh, you know, uh, I always say that the dominating, even now the dominating uh, technology in storage, other than pump hydro, which Mikhail correctly pointed out, uh, other than pump hydro uh, 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 is lead acid. Lithium ion has a huge share of voice because it's driven by um, superstar companies and, you know, VC kind of a lot of capital behind lithium ion. It has a great share of voice, but its applications are limited to usables and com computers and EV. And it's now starting to come into the grid and and uh, but but let us it dominates it's uh, I think three four times the size of thing but so the point is that battery technology uh, I think is going to uh, really be the future and fuel cells will be a footnote in the history of storage and within battery technology because of the attributes now that we figured out how to use supercaps for storage others will also figure it out and we will become an industry which will then eventually. Um, make electrochemical storage also a footnote in the storage history. So that's where I I stand. You said be passionate. I've taken a view, and I I don't know. Let's see what the wow. attendees vote for. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, I appreciate it. I think I've learned more about super cap technologies in in ten minutes than uh, you know that I've learned in the last five years uh, by having a person like Omar who can put me right and give it to us straight uh, and yes thanks for not sitting on the fence you've made it clear what your position is uh, and and i appreciate that uh, and uh, i i'm now going to uh, so thanks for that omar i'm now because two of our presenters have not made it yet today professor dmitry basarabov uh, and, and to be a bishop of nims so i'm going to do something really unconventional now and probably frowned upon you know, in debating circles uh, around the world. Uh, but uh, my co-host has said to me, you know what, Chris, you must now argue the case because we haven't got Tobias here. Uh, we haven't got uh, Dimitri here uh, to argue the case for, for hydrogen and fuel cells. So she appointed me as an ad hoc speaker. And I'm uh, really a little bit panicky at, at the prospect uh, because uh, you know I haven't prepared anything and I'm going to speak off the cuff. So and I'm doing you know what should never be done. The co-host or one of the hosts now becomes a part of the debate. Uh, it should be it should be strictly forbidden. But I, my arm has been completely twisted by Joanne and she's very persuasive and I don't want to get on the wrong side of Joanne. So I'm going to now talk to you about why hydrogen is the answer. And the first thing I want to put all these presenters right about these battery boys, uh, that electricity is not energy itself. Electricity is not energy storage. Electricity uh, is just a transport mechanism. And the world of energy is much bigger than electricity. I mean, did you know that in South Africa, the transportation sector, liquid fuels, oil and, and diesel and petrol as a, as, as a carrier of, of energy is bigger than, than electricity, bigger than the whole of ESCOM and all the others in the electricity game. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about energy storage, not just electric vehicles and, you know, which is a, and, and, and not just cars, which is a very small part of the transportation sector, big in volume, big in numbers of cars, but not big in terms of the real energy uh, driving uh, this, uh, but not big in terms of diesel and petrol and oil. That's what we've got to replace. That's what we've got to go green about. And that's what battery energy storage will never do. Because battery energy storage is a net consumer of electricity. It doesn't actually produce any new electricity. It actually uses energy. It has, and, 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 and as such, it's just another burden on the world. Because you have to charge it up. And to do that, in, if you do this in South Africa, what are you doing? You're charging it from coal-fired power. 
Uh, yes, we're going to transition. Yes, yes, yes. But is this now? Have we got green batteries now? Of course not. They all get charged on coal. And then they waste some of that electricity into the air and heat, etc. So don't give us the story that batteries are just some magic uh, solution to the green future. No, not at all. They use coal-fired power in South Africa now, today. Big talk about batteries are now. Yeah, they are now, but they're using coal-fired power and they're burning uh, uh, energy and not creating new energy. New energy comes from the sun, from the wind, and, uh, and, and, and we need to replace fossil fuels. So that's, that's the future. So batteries is not there yet. Contrary to what all these things that you've heard, batteries are a long way from being green. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, make that point, and I better watch my time because then I'll be accused of uh, not only giving a presentation, but but abusing my status to, to claim more time. So I've got another five minutes. So yeah, I, I wanted to make this point that um, yeah, cars, yeah, we're going to need a, a battery storage, uh, you know, to replace uh, petrol uh, cars, but they still use coal-fired power at least for a, for another ten years or so. Um, but we got to look to where the real energy in mobility comes from is used for and that is public transport taxis buses trucks heavy duty haulage trains and ships and aircrafts are going to have to change not to batteries they're not going to have batteries in there they're going to run on green aviation fuel produced from hydrogen and that is where the real energy is so if we're talking about the future of energy we're not talking about batteries operating ships around the world a fleet of ships hundreds of these bloody things are not going to be operating on batteries they're going to be operated on probably on green ammonia produced from hydrogen uh, and the same applies to trains they're not going to have big batteries on trains, nor on buses, nor on taxis. Yes, lots of vehicles, but it's not, a, it's, it's, it's not about the number of vehicles. It's about the volume of energy that we're talking about. Uh, so having said that, let's just touch on a few uh, things in the last two minutes that, 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 that I've got. When we talk about South Africa Incorporated, Bertie has talked about and explained that there's a massive opportunities for battery in South Africa, but they're all imported, the whole lot of them. Yes, maybe we need to start making them locally, but it's not happening. So this big opportunity that Bertie talks about is not going to be served by South African local manufacturers, that's for sure. Uh, and what I want to talk about, the promise of hydrogen is to produce hydrogen locally in South Africa, using South African sun, using South African wind, using South African land and South African people to produce green hydrogen, which we can do two things with. Number one, we can export it. There is a massive demand for hydrogen growing, not just in Europe, but Europe and America, Japan, Korea, uh, the industrial nations of the world are totally committed to moving to green hydrogen by 2050. It is massive. This is done on, on a huge scale. So there's a huge export opportunity, number one. Number two, if we can use this to, uh, to drive and to transition our, our, our transportation sector, we're going to replace imported oil, imported diesel, imported petrol, we're going to stop producing dirty coal and we're going to produce this all locally in South Africa, which has got massive job creation right here in South Africa. So I want to say to you in closing that I think battery storage forms a small sector in the energy storage market. Yes, it's going to have a little corner, but the real energy is not in the production of electricity. <laughs> That's not where the big thing is. It's in the production of steel, in cement, in glass, in uh, transportation, uh, and in chemicals. 
And this is where hydrogen as an energy, a long-term energy storage medium, hydrogen, or hydrogen derivatives like green ammonia, this is long-term storage that is the big part of the industry and not the small part. That's it for me. Uh, I hope I've presented the case in, in, in 10 minutes for hydrogen. And uh, well, I think maybe I presented a different picture than all these battery boys. <laughs> so that's it for me, guys. So we've come to the end of the presentations. And it's really now to um, come in with the questions to the audience. And this is where I'm presented with a little bit of a difficulty because I have to handle both. Um, having been a presenter myself, but I will now put on my 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 um, host hat and uh, become completely impartial uh, you know, to our various speakers. And uh, I'm looking at the questions on the um, uh, on the chat, and, and I only see one at the moment. Uh, but can I please ask our presenters to switch on their videos? And uh, but switch off your microphones. Uh, so just put on your video so we can all see you. And I'm going to sort of field some questions that I see in the chat. Uh, I can at the moment only see one. So I would like to ask our attendees uh, to please feel free to post questions on the Q&A facility. But uh, I'm going to kind of open this up for a general discussion. So I'm going to read the question and I'm going to try and pose it to to one or two or three of you in the audience, and you're most welcome on the panel, the panel at least. I'm gonna ask the panel to maybe discuss this, uh, you know, uh, when they want to, you just make your, yourself known that you want something to say, uh, uh, panel, and by waving your hand, and I will then call on you to, to, to respond. So I've got a comment here, it's a general comment. It says here, since the dawn of time, all energy available on Earth uh, originates from the sun, which is a large nuclear reactor fueled by hydrogen. We should learn from nature and use the abundance of solar energy and seawater to produce hydrogen directly with nano bio engines. Fuel cells can then convert the hydrogen to electricity and demineralized water. Uh, now I've lost my place. Uh, uh, nano by engines and convert it to electricity and demineralized water, which can uh, be remineralized by the byproducts from the seawater to make it drinkable. So th that, that's a comment uh, from a from a person in the audience to say he, he, he's sort of speaking the hydrogen language. So I'm going to now go over to Mikhail as a starting point. Mikhail, what do you say to, to, to that? Well, I, I would say to that, that first of all, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a physicist, and I know I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm also not an engineer. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, despite all of those deficiencies, you know, my understanding is that the sun has not actually provided all of the energy on Earth since its beginnings. Um, and then again, it depends on how you, you think about physics and dependencies, but certainly things like gravity on Earth uh, and potential energy that can come from that is not solar related. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people working on uh, wave technology that has uh, generation that has nothing to do with the, with the sun, but rather other cosmic um, bodies. So I would just start off with, uh, with, with that. I think that there's a, I think a, a misconception about the assumption, not, not to say that the sun is not important, but, but just I think the premise there is a, is, is a little limited. And so maybe that just goes to the fact that there are different ways that um, you know, physics allows us to, to create uh, energy, to store energy. Um, and maybe that is also then part of that whole um, gamut of potential technologies that can use those different types of um, means that, uh, you know, that, 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 that the cosmos has allowed for us. It's not just one. Yeah, Omar, why don't you come in here and give us your thought? I mean, you said that this fuel cell technology and by implication hydrogen is going to be relegated to a back, uh, uh, you know, a back office of history. Uh, so, what do you say uh, to this comment so, from? So one I'm of also our listening listeners? to engineers, so I don't want to get into trouble again. 
like Mikhail, but uh, so so I don't understand what when when someone says that the sun has provided energy to the earth. Uh, I mean, the sun provides two things, heat and light. And these are then converted somehow, you know, when man was in the cave, I don't know what he did with the heat and light, you know, he, he didn't have cars back then. So, uh, 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 you know, the uh, all, all, all sources of energy, uh, waves, uh, uh, wind, uh, you know, geothermal, they, they they form uh, provide uh, sources of energy. Um, so, uh, and and your point and your uh, you know your last ten minutes about uh, energy being the 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 thing to focus on is really about you know fossil fuels don't you know they 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 are converted into energy. Okay, so 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 they are put into a car and then that. Fossil fuel goes into the piston and it, it creates an explosion that creates the energy that gives motion to the car. Okay. Similarly, a battery, uh, 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 instead of sending in a fossil fuel uh, burst of petrol that gets exploded, that's explored and gives energy, just gives the energy. So uh, the fossil fuel uh, is a uh, um, uh, has to be converted into energy. Whereas a battery carries the energy, so the fossil fuel in itself is a vessel for energy itself. So um, I think that the whole world's energy sources will come from renewable energy, from the sun. I'm I'm doing this every day. I go and electrify villages. I don't need hydrogen. I've never needed hydrogen. I've never needed, with all due respect, Mikhail, flow batteries either, right? Because because my storage system provides 18 hours without degradation, without anything, and the sun provides me with the light that I use solar panels to convert energy into. So um, I find it very difficult to uh, align with the fossil fuel industry. Fossil fuel industry should start decarbonizing and going electric and not continue to use fossil fuels. Hydrogen can be used for many other things. Uh, 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 not for energy. Yeah, yeah I, I think Omar, what the what the the the, the, the uh, question uh, was posed about, and uh, uh, is that yeah that energy comes from the sun, uh, wind energy ultimately comes from the sun uh, because the movement of the waves, um, the movement of the air, all comes from uh, the, the the energy imparted into the atmosphere. Uh, by the sun, even uh, you know, even hydrocarbons ultimately uh, come from the sun in the sense that it's caused by photosynthesis and vegetation and vegetables and uh, over billions of years, uh, you know, building up coal and oil and gas, uh, you know, within within the body of the earth, which we exploit. But ultimately, it all comes from uh, the sun. Uh, okay, the, the potential energy, uh, uh, Mikhail, and gravity energy is, is 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 a valid point. I think what I wanted to get at now is uh, a question about uh, the question of uh, the cyclical nature of energy and renewability and sustainability, uh, and 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 a point to and ask you the question. To, and I'm going to put this one to, to Bertie, uh, and then we'll go to Chris. Hydrogen, let's just say you can create from the wind and the sun, you create hydrogen gas, which is a carrier of energy and a storage vehicle of energy. And you can use that for all kinds of things, including fuel cells, but not limited to fuel cells. You can use it as a source of heat and steel, you can use it as heat for smelting glass. You can use that storage medium for all kinds of things. Um, you can use it to create green chemicals, et cetera, et cetera, which when you burn them, you can either burn hydrogen or you can burn um, ammonia or, or, or green aviation fuel produced from hydrogen. When you burn it, the net product is water, nothing else. So you go from water back to water with net zero carbon emissions. And that to me is really renewable. It's a cyclical process. 
contrasting that to other where there's uh, uh, you know significant waste products uh, waste streams from this whole production it cannot be really classed as fully recyclable uh, so again I, 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 I put the question and I think uh, it, it comes from the previous question too that they say you know we should be using the sun and the wind which is coming from the sun to hydrolyze water to produce hydrogen to do interesting things with and ultimately back to water the sun is always there and the water is one circular fuel uh, so let's ask bertie uh, what he thinks about this what do you think about this idea is it all uneconomical nonsense Chris, I won't say it, it's economical nonsense, but I think in order to achieve that, there's a huge infrastructure, logistical network, um, what else we need to put in place in order to effectively try and materialize the hydrogen economy. Um, so it's not a localized place type of solution. Um, so the big challenge is here, how do we going to establish an afford in South Africa such an infrastructure if we don't even can, can do a lot of other things which is more critical? So I think we have got an economy that, that's running on fossil fuels, which basically is not necessarily green, but to replace or replicate that infrastructure, it's going to cost this country a a massive amount of money which we haven't got. So although it's it's ideal to achieve that objection, I think there's a reality that we need to understand how much green can you go for what you can afford. And I think that's the key decision that we have to make. To go full green in South Africa in the short term is not going to happen. Um, mm. The question is how much can we afford and how can we optimize within in that space? Mm. Chris, um, Jubeir, would you like to come in here and give us some thoughts? Uh, you, you kind of had a foot in both camps, um, including uh, uh, the super cap camp. Uh, so uh, wh wh what are your thoughts uh, about the reality of, of, of a hydrogen economy? Um, is, it, is it just hot air? Well, uh, yeah, I don't think it's just hot air, and I think it's early days uh, regarding the infrastructure. I don't believe we will get to the point that we have in Germany, for example, or Japan with such an infrastructure where uh, they in the past used hydrogen for district heating and all things like that. However, I think the um, move by Toyota and Sasol to create a hydrogen highway, which is on the cards and they're developing that, uh, that is the kind of application that will work for South Africa. Um, but, but it's quite interesting talking about this, this uh, cyclic uh, uh, nature. Uh, and I, I've read up a little bit on this today because the question is, is hydrogen a fuel or is it energy storage? Uh, an energy storage medium, and and but in the same way, you can also say is is petrol uh, energy storage or is it the fuel? So it all depends on on the environment where you utilize it. But I do believe that that uh, we cannot ignore the development of a hydrogen economy. Um, we there are many many applications, and whether it will be rather in terms of uh, of generating green hydrogen for industrial applications, uh, things like also green fertilizer, that's also on the cards. And, and with that, we will start getting economies of scale with hydrogen that, that can be applied in, in many instances. So, uh, and we are going to be forced to, to get into a hydrogen economy just for shipping side. Uh, we have many ships coming around our coast and, and uh, we will have to produce hydrogen or uh, liquid hydrogen in, in ammonia. I'm involved in, in a number of green hydrogen projects now, and 
and some of them do methanol, some do uh, ammonia, and and uh, I don't think we can neglect uh, hydrogen, but it, it, it it's not, and that's why I said I don't think our normal passenger vehicle. Uh, electric uh, passenger vehicles throughout the country will be driven by hydrogen, but there are specific uh, uh, niches where hydrogen will work. And, and the underground uh, mining industry, of course, it's extremely important and they're saving lots of energy because they don't have to extract all of the fumes and heat that's, that's created by the, the diesel trucks, etc. So uh, I think there is a place for it. And, and uh, it will probably grow beyond my expectation at this point in time. Uh, thanks uh, for, for that. And um, uh, I, I want to, while you there, Chris, just stay on the line there. Um, uh, you, you, in your presentation, talked about a lithium and cobalt dump, uh, mm -hmm. implying, you know, significant waste streams that have yet to be uh, dealt with um, yeah. and, uh, and and so I want to pick up on that because again it gets back to this uh, the circular nature uh, uh, where where the precious resources are recyclable and I want to also bring in here Mikhail because he has told me about vanadium uh, flow uh, batteries where the electrolyte this vanadium electrolyte effectively has an infinite life and is not a waste stream that it eventually comes to the end of its life. It effectively can be reprocessed and reprocessed and reprocessed ad infinitum. Uh, so I want to pick up, first of all, with you, Chris, just to, to expand a little bit on this idea of that you talked about of a lithium and cobalt dump. And then we'll move to Mikhail and ask him to expand upon and tell us about uh, vanadium flow and, and, and the electrolyte and, 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 and how they use it at infinitum. So over to you, Chris. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I've read a lot about this and I got my facts from the uh, from uh, international sources. Uh, and I believe that in Australia, for example, they have tried to get to recycle cell phone batteries and, and in many years, they've managed to, to recycle 2% of it. Secondly, lithium batteries don't last very long. And, and people are now trying to shift the second life, as they call it, lithium batteries from Africa. People call me from LA and they ask me that I want to import those and, and uh, sell it locally. But those batteries are already past half of their life or more than that. Now they want to put it into Africa. And I believe those batteries, after the second life, and they will deteriorate quite quickly, they will end up in a dump. We don't have the infrastructure to, and, and systems to actually recycle those. And, and then uh, we know what is in, what we get on the components in lithium batteries, and it's not good for the environment. On the other hand, also the just mining lithium is a dirty, thing. It, it's not good for the environment. They're using lots and lots of water in that process, which used to be utilized for agriculture. For example, in Chile, uh, we know about uh, in, in China how they actually poison the rivers and the, and the animals die from, from the outfall from lithium mines. So that's why I, I cannot see that, that we can go on, especially with these large uh, utility scale batteries. Do you know how many million lithium cells goes into a one megawatt watt lithium battery? And, and those things cannot be good for the environment. And therefore, rather use something like a flow battery that has a life. The flow battery that I'm working with, with is the iron flow battery. Uh, and, and that has a life of 25 plus years uh, when you can just refurbish it and use it for another couple of decades. And, and the uh, electrolyte is totally clean. It is, uh, it, there's, it's not corrosive like other electrolytes and it doesn't have to be augmented at all or balanced at all throughout its lifetime. 
So that that's I believe is the safer way to go for utility scale batteries. Yeah, I think Chris, you 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 I think you yeah. highlighted the view, view that in fact battery lithium batteries are not sustainable. In other words, uh, uh, they are not renewable uh, in the sense that they they at the end of life there is this finished product. Uh, so it's not sustainable energy it, it, it eventually as you've put it creates a, a dump and uh, and and how sustainable is that uh, the resource the lithium resource is not sustainable nor is the cobalt resource Mikhail come in here and tell us a little bit about your flow batteries and and and, and the and the electrolyte used yeah sure thanks Chris um so one of the one of the I would say advantages, and historically it's been cited as a disadvantage of the vanadium uh, flow battery technology, is the high cost contribution of of the vanadium itself compared to other minerals. I think all the other benefits in terms of the the non degradation, the long life, and the fact that it actually works. I mean you, that's why you have about two dozen vanadium battery companies, whereas any other kind of flow, whether it's iron or zinc or organic, you might have one or two companies. You know, but basically the company is the technology. Whereas um, I think vanadium's got its own ecosystem, but the big the big thing um, that we have tried to do is to take advantage of the fact that while all the other components of the battery do degrade over time due to use or just the fact that things like plastic and um, and steel do de deteriorate from being exposed to to the elements, not to mention mechanical parts or electrical parts, the the part that does not degrade is the actual electrolyte because the reduction reaction that happens is completely re reversible. There's no pathways that are created in the liquid. So one thing is you've got a 10 year, 10 year uh, project design or 20 year project design. Yes, you will replace the hardware um, after that time, but you can put in another battery using the same exact electrolyte if it's, from, if it's from the same company. So that basically creates that almost infinite reusability of the most expensive component in the battery. And over time, because it's so mineral uh, and commodity dependent, the other stuff will get cheaper with scale, but not the commodity because it's market driven. The second thing though, is let's say we don't need storage in, uh, in 50 years or in 40 years, then you can actually extract the vanadium from the electrolyte. It's just water, sulfuric acid and vanadium. The sulfuric acid is a stabilizer. We use sulfuric acid in South Africa in the metallurgical process at Rovan, which is a Glencore mine, at uh, Vimentco, which is a Bushveld mine, to, to process vanadium from, um, from, from the ore. So there's, there's no, you know, anything new that needs to be created to recycle it. There's no new infrastructure. And the benefit is that once we introduce this electrolyte into the, into the metallurgical streams, we can actually reduce the mining bit. We still need the, the, the processing infrastructure, so people still get employed, right? But the benefit is we're not, we don't need to extract as much, so we're not cutting into the ground as much, and we don't need to fill up our, our, our dams with some of that earlier metallurgical processes that, that need, that need to, to happen. So it's, the benefit there is it's still using infrastructure, it's still allowing the communities that have been there that aren't gonna go anywhere, at least, you know, uh, and so it creates, it keeps that, that issue that we, we have now in the just energy transition in South Africa, where the geography of where the jobs are, are is changing. Here, at least, we know that we're, while we're changing the business model, we actually don't have to change the geography of where, uh, of where the employment happens. So we, we actually yeah. need some of the same skills, but they're just using a different feedstock to create, uh, to create vanadium in generations to come. So it's a great way to actually pass wealth, mineral wealth, from one generation to another. Thank you, Mikhail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've been prodded by my producers to say that uh, we should start wrapping up now. Um, so uh, before we do that, uh, and if I then uh, may, and by the way, my apologies to the audience, I've only just figured out how the Q&A box works here. Uh, I was struggling the whole presentation to try and make it readable and expand it and uh, and because of my computer illiteracy, uh, I was struggling too long. So we haven't even dealt with not even a tiny fraction of the actual questions that we asked. And so may I give my humble apologies to the audience for not uh, handling those. But I think we have had a, an interesting and useful uh, interaction and discussion that has been quite vibrant and I hope also interesting and entertaining. Uh, but I would like to now call an end uh, to the Q&A. 
uh, and to ask first of all our presenters uh, and to thank our presenters uh, for, for all your efforts and time being part of this and, and I know Joanne's going to come in and Minx is going to come in and say a few words but before we do that if I can ask the presenter to switch off their microphones and their videos uh, because we're now going to go to the closing poll uh, and um, uh, colleagues and presenters and uh, uh, and all uh, watching this uh, here is the poll we're gonna it's the same poll as we did in the beginning uh, to ask you again having heard all the presenters and their presentations and what they've been telling us about batteries and uh, etc and and also having heard my little pitch for for hydrogen um which uh, I, as i say i picked up at the last minute i was asked to step in and make the case for hydrogen in the absence of, of tobias and uh, professor uh, uh, dimitri uh, who weren't able to make it and um, so I, I hope you will forgive me for being both a host and a presenter but um i think it was necessary to make that case for hydrogen uh, because it was sort of missing i think so your opinion matters to us. We're interested to know, and of course, it's going to be an indication of the level of debate and how convincing the debaters were. But can I ask you now to redo this poll? Uh, is the future of stationary and mobile energy storage, is it hydrogen and fuel cell technology? Is it battery energy storage technology? And that includes, of course, uh, a super cap technology. Or are both of these the solution? So I'm going to give you a little bit of time again. I'm going to ask you uh, to uh, please vote as part of the audience. Um, and we're very interested to see if there's been any change in the figures that we had to begin with, which would indicate that one of the debaters or two of the debaters or whatever were very convincing in their arguments uh, one way or another. Uh, so, guys, please uh, carry on and vote. And Minx, if you can tell me when you think that the voting is finished and you're not getting any more votes coming in. In the meantime, just have a look at the question, click the radio button of interest that you think uh, correctly reflects, um, you know, your view after having heard uh, our esteemed presenters uh, give their points of view. Um, Minx, uh, tell us when the uh, when the uh, situation is over, and you can then present the results when that is done. So let's give it a few more seconds. Uh, any stragglers out there who want to vote, please vote quickly now. Uh, we need to move on. Uh, if I can ask you to cast your vote on this poll, and then we will see the results and see if there are any interesting outcomes that come from this debate. How are you going there, Minx? Yes, uh, I'll wait another 20 seconds or 15 okay. seconds, and then we'll close the poll. Many thanks, Minx. Uh, Minx is the lady from the SAIEE who's basically in charge of this uh, uh, webinar in the back office, uh, making sure that the slides roll and that everything happens on time. And uh, yes, so we've now closed the poll and look what we've got here. Interesting here. So we've got uh, the, the number of people for hydrogen fuel cells went down from 7% to 6%. The number of people for battery energy storage went up from 13% to 29%. Wow, you guys have sold yourself well, hey? Eh? And the, the number of people that think that both are part of the solution has gone down from 80% to 60%. So it's quite clear that I was the, the worst debater uh, and I was not convincing at all in my hydrogen pitch uh, and that the hydrogen uh, boys uh, won the day uh, because they really went up from 13% to 26% and they knocked, really they knocked, the ones that said both reduced the most. The hydrogen went down a little bit, batteries went up a lot and those that voted for both went down uh, quite a lot from 80% to 65%. So a really interesting debate, hope you enjoyed it all. It was supposed to be fun and not science uh, and I'm now going to uh, hand over to my co-presenter or my co-host at least, uh, Joanne, uh, to say a few words. Uh, Joanne, over to you. Hi, right, Chris. Thank you very much um, to all our presenters and everybody. Um, a great big thanks, and especially to our attendees. I think it's been it's been very interesting and it's been entertaining, Chris. And I think that's what you set out to do, and it has been. And I think the thing that really came through to me most is that 
it's, it's, it's alive. When you said about the passion, energy is definitely the pulse of our day-to-day -day life and how we create it is changing rapidly. What the future will look like, I don't think we all know. I think we're also but debating. <laughs> but what is clear is that we're well on our way to a new energy future. And can you imagine there's a world of opportunities and possibilities and, and the idea of the sustainability is abundant. So economic activity has grown far faster than energy consumption today in technological improvements. We saw now the debates. So the minute that information sharing is out there, people can start actually making decisions. The first steps are being taken to the transition and people need this information sharing, these debates, these conversations to be able to unlock um, the true decisions. I think we all know that the international goal is we have to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by at least 95% by 2050. And this has got serious implications onto the energy system. Hence these debates about where are we off to and you know what is the future energy mix going to do. And I think that I really want to take a leaf out of, um, I think it was Mikhail that said, that we need to act and we need to act quickly. And we know that the South African energy networks are aging. We know that it's going to cost billion rand, billions of rands with their investment. So the current investment cycle must be one that transforms SA's energy system. And if not, then really seriously, guys, we're going to be locked into this, this, this negative emissions for decades. So from my esteemed speakers, thank you very much, you guys. You've been absolutely awesome. You've given us windows into insights for choices to be made. And our host, um, Chris, you are a renowned energy expert. Thank you for leading and controlling and also cementing the fact that there are technologies and that we need to make decisions and we need to act. And then for myself, I want to call out to, to all the attendees and, and, and to your peers in your networks. We would love to see you joining the, sto the storage um, chapters, um, whether you want to join the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers Storage Chapter, um, SAISA, which we also represent, the SAISA um, South African Energy Storage Association. But we need to collectively think tank and we need to pull, pull. We need to roll up our sleeves and create information sharing so that people can actually make these decisions and start taking these steps to act. And um, I think that's all I really want to say. Then I would really like to thank Minx for all her patience with us and for, for hosting this um, debate. And I hope that we can actually make this the first debate of many to share information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. And thank you very much, Chris. Thank you both for hosting this debate. And I really hope that we, this is not the, first, the last one. I'm looking forward to hosting these in the near future. We, I think we should at least have one every second month to just see where we are. As Joanne just said, we have to act now. We have to make this happen. I also just want to thank from the SIE side, um, our panelists, Mr. Baki Stradom, Mr. Chris Joubert, um, uh, Mr. Mikhail Nikomarov, and Mr. Omar Ghani, all the way from the US. Thank you so much for availing yourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, and as Chris said, we didn't get through all the questions because we ran out of time. But I will download all your questions and I will have it been answered by our presenters, our panelists and our hosts. And I will, we will upload this onto the SIE website under the webinars. Um, as I mentioned before, the recording of this webinar will be uploaded tomorrow morning under the Energy Storage Playlist on the SIE TV channel on YouTube. The link is in the chat box and I urge you to subscribe. It is free. And then you can also receive notifications of uh, future webinars and also had a look, have a look at our past webinars. I thank you all for joining us and um, watch out for our next advert. And Chris and Joanne, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Good night. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Here we are. Okay, thank bye. you, everyone. Bye.